Thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this, the third in our series of webinars, exploring areas of the human-animal bond and some technological issues as well. Uh, just a word about GoToWebinar. Everyone other than our presenter has been muted to ensure a clear presentation without background noise or other distractions. Um, there is a chat box on the lower right on your dashboard, and we invite you to type in any questions you'd like to ask our presenter at the cl conclusion of his talk. I'll be forwarding the questions to him, and he'll answer as many as possible in the time frame of the webinar. Also, if you have any technical issues, as we have, please let us know through the chat box, and we'll do our best to walk you through fixing them. I'm very excited that today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Andrew Rowan, the president of Humane Society University. Drawing on his extensive historical and sociological knowledge of the human-animal bond, Dr. Rowan will explore the legendary and imaginative creations of human mythology and literature that have helped shape our dreams and our nightmares. Dr. Rowan's expertise and experience span the globe. In addition to his work as president of the Humane Society University, Dr. Rowan also serves as President and CEO of Humane Society International. He is Chief International Officer and Chief Scientific Officer for the Humane Society of the United States and Board President of the HSUS Wildlife Land Trust. He serves on the committees of several animal protection groups, including the World Society for the Protection of Animals, the Advisory Committee on Animal Testing for Royal Dutch Shell, and the National Institutes of Health Ad Hoc Advisory Committee on Chimpanzee Sanctuaries. He has published scholarly books and articles on a wide range of topics, including animal research, the development and implementation of alternatives to animals, the moral status of animals, companion animal demographics and the challenge of unwanted dogs and cats, immunocontraception, and humane wildlife management, and the development and status of the animal protection movement. He also serves in numerous other advisory and consultative roles, including with the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Research Council. Dr. Rowan earned his doctorate in biochemistry at Oxford University after earning his master's degree in the same discipline at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. I am honored to turn over the presentation to Dr. Andrew Rowan. Dr. Rowan, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan, and welcome. And if you can't hear me now, please, well, of course, um, that's a silly statement. If you can't hear me now, send the chat thing because you wouldn't know what I was saying. But um, uh, I am going to sort of move straight into the uh, presentation. And um, this uh, actually uh, is, not my, this is not my first time I, I've addressed this issue, as you can see uh, from the photograph. That was a conference that we held on October the 31st, uh, back in the mid-1990s in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, at the Hawthorne Inn, uh, and uh, we addressed many of the same themes. And I've been I've been anxious to sort of explore this theme myself uh, ever since, in something uh, sort of a little longer uh, and a little more detailed. So um, uh, finally, um, my colleagues at Humane Society University uh, held me to my, my statement that I was going to do uh, a talk on beasts of the imagination, and so here we are today. Um, just, uh, I, I've just returned from Los Angeles and um, was reading uh, the newspaper in the uh, waiting room, uh, airport waiting room, and uh, in the variety section, or the sort of style section, they carried a story about the AMC season three premiere of The Walking Dead. Um, the Sunday rollout of this, of this uh, the third year, th third year of this program drew 10.9 million viewers, a 50% increase from season two, and ranked it as the biggest telecast of any drama series in basic cable history. Um, Walking Dead also drew 7.3 million viewers in the 18 to 49 viewer category, um, which is a larger number than any of the current four entertainment shows. And the question I would ask is, what is going on here? Why does a show about zombies who eat human flesh uh, do this well, do, uh, does this well in attracting viewers? Um, how does playing on human fears and symbols of horrors 
uh, symbols of horror are viewed as entertainment. At Halloween, which is fast approaching, we encourage our children to dress up as scary beasts and monsters and go out into the night to trick or treat. So, so what, what's happening here? Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to sort of explore a number of things. That it, this is not um, pulled together with any sort of major coherent theme. Um, other than um, there are a lot of animals and monsters uh, and monster-like animals that are um, part of our lives, especially around this time of the year. And so I, I'm going to be sort of looking at some of these, and looking at some of their sort of not just biological but sort of cultural history, um, and then uh, discussing a, uh, you know, sort of at the end uh, what it might mean for Halloween and um, what, what, what we understand about Halloween. So a whole bunches of different animals, and, and probably um, one of the most mythic um, or sort of most central animals in the sort of mythology of, the, of monsters is the dragon. Um, it's a composite beast. It combines the attributes of many different animals. and They vary from culture to culture and from time to time, but the common features include wings, a scaly skin, um, uh, the... Uh, um, the sort of snake aspect, the four clawed feet, sometimes horns, and deadly breath. Um, dragons are usually imbued with supernatural powers, and when they represent the forces of evil, uh, require correspondingly heroic adversaries like Siegfried, who slew the dragon Fafnir in Norse mythology. And, and many of us grew up with books that involved the slaying of dragons, and of course uh, St. George of England um, had to slay a dragon. And the dragon represents a whole variety of um, different fears and, and concerns, the societal individual fears and concerns. And so the slaying of the dragon is representing sort of returning order. Um, the dragon's not the only sort of composite beast that uh, we have in our folklore. Um, the sphinx is, uh, is another. Um, the centaurs are, are others, and, and many of these have both sort of godlike and animal-like um, qualities. Mary Midgley, uh, a British philosopher whose writings I've greatly admired and learned from over the years, um, she writes beautifully clearly, notes that the Greeks needed somebody to blame for human faults. And they turned away from the gods and towards animals and animal monsters to help manage their fears and personify the other. Well, in fact, this is more uh, as Christians uh, sort of came into, um, uh, uh, sort of started populating the world. Uh, the Christians um, were not sort of terribly comfortable having God be uh, the personification of their fears. And so there were monsters that, that um, they sort of adopted from some of the Greek myths at that time. The Minotaur is a classic one of these monsters. Um, it's the treacherous element cannot be um, anything fully human. It has to be something that has uh, human qualities, perhaps, but is um, otherwise um, uh, uh, bastardized or uh, problematic, and must have a sense of the other, the beast within, to explain and cope with the many demons that uh, exist in our world. And so the Minotaur, a half-human, half-bull creature, fed on virgins, there's, there are these classic sexual images in many of the monster tales, um, had to be slain by Theseus, um, and uh, in order to once again sort of bring order, it probably helped that the uh, the Minotaur lived in Crete, and the Cretans were um, uh, sort of uh, opponents uh, of the Greeks at the time, and so um, it helped for the Greeks to imbue the Minotaur with with these these sort of uh, monstrous qualities, and then have it slain by a good Greek like Theseus. So the Minotaur represents, in Midgley's argument, uh, the, the counterpart to the rational soul. It's, uh, it's sort of irrational, it's, it's full of um, needs and, 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 and sort of monstrous appetites that it needs to, um, uh, needs to satisfy. Throughout the Middle Ages, Christianity struggled with the monsters and, and animals handed down from humanities animus beginnings. The shamanic uh, people in the hunter-gatherer societies uh, looked to the animals as a way of helping to interpret the world and also trying to bring some order to a world that was full of danger and threats. 
And animals were useful example, exemplars for, for the Greeks. Um, everybody knows of Aesop's fables, these morality tales that uh, try and teach us uh, particular little moral lessons um, through each of the fables. Um, but they, um, uh, the, the Christians uh, uh, took them in as well and used them to teach morality tales. Although the Christian interaction with them uh, was somewhat, uh, people were somewhat troubled. The, the early church um, wanted to um, set itself apart from the sort of pagan background uh, and the sort of multiple God nature of, of the world that the early church found itself in. And so there was a lot of ambivalence towards, uh, towards the use of animals um, in this way. And for a while, um, the sort of animals as moral teachers um, disappeared from much of the teachings of the Middle Ages, uh, but came back um, uh, in, the, uh, in the, about the 12th century and thereafter. Um, you know, I mean, there's some fascinating anecdotes and stories <laughs> around all of this stuff. Um, the uh, tale of St. Guinefor in France um, uh, is repeated all over the world. Um, in India, it, it, it's not a, it's the creature that is unjustly killed by, you know, the humans it's been helping um, is a mongoose, which kills a cobra. And so, um, and those of you who know uh, the Kipling tales will remember Ricky, uh, will have remembered Ricky Tikki Tavi, um, the mongoose that helped uh, the family um, in which it lived at the time. But Saint Guinefor was a greyhound, and was um, sainted. And um, there's this, uh, it's a, it's a French creature, although a very similar tale exists in Wales. And what happened here was that. Um, Typically, uh, some noble or person of uh, the, uh, sort of high status uh, goes off and leaves the baby and the greyhound, the dog, um, together and expects the dog to guard the baby. Comes back, finds the baby, um, at the crib knocked over, sheets bloodstained, blood on the mouth of the dog, and in a rage kills the dog at which point the baby cries out and um, the uh, master realizes um, the mistake and looks a bit more closely and finds in the case of Guinefor a snake, um, in the case of the Welsh story a, a wolf, uh, but finds a dead predator, prey, spe animal that was going after the baby and the greyhound and the, or the, the wolfhound or whatever the dog is had saved the baby from uh, being killed. Um, so uh, at that point in time, mortified and ashamed of what uh, he had done, uh, he uh, um, buries the greyhound or buries the dog um, with full honor and everything else and um, uh, erects a monument to uh, its memory. The uh, Saint Guinefor was a, st a tale in uh, medieval France and um, Etienne de Bourbon, uh, who was an inquisitor, um, who was uh, just around Lyon, uh, recorded um, in his diary, in his narrative, that um, women that were coming into confession uh, would talk about um, taking their children to St. Guinefor. Uh, Bourbon eventually, initially thought that this was a, a human saint, uh, but when he learned that it was a dog, um, he proclaimed that the dog couldn't possibly be a saint, but it could, in fact, be a heretic. Um, and uh, so it was then um, uh, he went to this place, exhumed the bones of the dog, burned the bones, chopped down the grove of trees which were planted around the place by the master who, in, in, in sorrow and shame, and burned the trees. But as one can see, um, uh, despite Bourbon's attempts to eradicate this cult, um, it, it, it was maintained. And um, in fact, people continued to visit the grove up until 1940, praying for the protection of their children. And ruins of a chapel dedicated to St. Guinefort survive at Trevor in Brittany, which is quite a ways away from uh, Lyon. But, you know, the, this, this tale continues to fascinate, continues to be part of the sort of ongoing sort of 
folklore and mythology sort of underlying human existence. And in 1987, a French movie was made about the dog called The Sorceress. So uh, dogs, um, you know, I mean, we can, we can dismiss St. Guinefor as um, an artifact of suspicious, ignorant people um, that are looking for some sort of comfort and certainty in an unpredictable world. But, you know, the, the question one might ask is, are humans that much more advanced, uh, are, are modern humans that much more advanced? In the Far East, um, dogs are killed and eaten because their flesh has uh, warming powers in China and Vietnam and cooling powers in Korea. It's not clear why these different countries see the dog, the dog meat as having these different qualities in these different places, but, but they do. Uh, and today, um, we promote animal-assisted therapy as a, um, uh, uh, and you can see um, this wonderful photograph of a veteran at Walter Reed Hospital uh, asleep um, with the therapy dog. Uh, and these sorts of photographs, are, are you, you see them all the time, uh, these types of associations. And of course, anybody who has a dog at home uh, knows this look very well. But, you know, so dogs carry uh, um, some important um, messages, liminal messages, that uh, we, we, we sort of associate uh, with benefits as well as other qualities. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I, my screen has just frozen. There we go. Um, humans and animals and the beast within. Okay, well, now we've got to uh, move on to another example of um, a sort of human-animal bond in, in, this, in, in these mythologies and folklore tales. And um, the witches uh, are uh, an exemplar here. And basically, this is a, a woodcut of a witch, a witch with her familiar. Um, and. Um, and the another woodcut of a witch with their familiars, a witches with their familiars. This the whole witchcraft phenomenon is a, a, a something that uh, historians have struggled to understand. Um, it's been ascribed to a variety of different um, reasons. Um, you know, people said, well, the midwives. This was a persecution of midwives that didn't hold up to historical analysis. It was a persecution of women. Uh, but 20% of witches tried were men. And so, you know, there's the, the I, just in the past decade or two have historians really begun to sort of uh, get a real grasp on this. But, but what was interesting to me was uh, the, uh, the, the whole familiar story um, and that these familiars were considered to be uh, the consort, the devil's consort that was uh, interceding between the witch and the devil. Uh, but uh, it was not always like this. I mean, one of the uh, fascinating aspects of some of the hagiographies, the biographies of saints, is that uh, many of them um, tell tales of how the saints uh, befriended the animals, either wild or domestic, uh, and that the animals had a special affinity with the saints. Uh, Saint Jerome, I think it was, was fed by ravens. Um, out in the desert. Um, uh, other saints have been warned of danger by, by animals, wild animals around them. And even to this day, if a wild, if a wild animal perches, if a bird perches on your hand and takes uh, uh, some grain from your hand, uh, you, you, it's extraordinary to look at the, uh, at the person who is feeding the bird. I mean, there's a sort of sense of wonder in their face when this wild animal does it. There's a sense that wild animals will be able to tell whether we're good or bad, and when, a, when an animal trusts you enough to come and take food from your hand, um, that's an affirmation that, in fact, you're a good person rather than a bad person. But back in, in these 15th to 17th century times, um, the, uh, the, the association with animals was not a positive thing. And um, while the animals retained their otherworldly qualities, uh, they now um, represented the devil and satanic practices rather than uh, positive virtues. So uh, uh, something, the estimates are somewhere between 30 to 40,000 people were um, killed, generally burnt at the stake. Um, the, the familiars that 
were, were in fact not a phenomenon of witchcraft all across uh, Europe. Um, they really only um, gathered a lot of uh, um, support from in Scandinavian countries and in uh, Great Britain. Um, that's where you see uh, the familiar as being a sort of a distinguishing mark um, identifying that this person may in fact be a witch. So the presence of an animal um, was a, a dangerous, uh, especially for some of the older women. Um, but in fact, now one of the, uh, James Serpell at, at the University of Pennsylvania has argued that in many of these cases, probably what was happening, these were simply um, lonely individuals without any sort of major uh, social support structure and they took up uh, and got comfort of, by taking care of an animal, um, as we see in the picture here. So um, moving on to some of the more traditional creatures, um, I don't know if anybody has ever played with this uh, Google um, tool, tool called the Ngram Viewer, but uh, it's really quite a fascinating uh, thing to play with. Um, you can type in words, and Google has digitized millions of books, and they, uh, this Ngram viewer then trolls through these books and finds the word or phrase that you've typed in and gives you a frequency distribution over the, over the years. And so here you can see um, that Wizard, for example, has ex exploded in 2000, uh, probably coincident with the Harry Potter books. Um, uh, vampire, see how the vampires were, um, you know, sort of present throughout the 1900 to 1970, but once again, 1980, um, interest in vampires took off, and Frankenstein uh, interest took off at about 1970, and then began to decline about 2000, while the vampires continued, and werewolves are the least popular of, this, of the group. So it gives you a sense of, in, human, in sort of our Western literature, um, uh, the frequency with it, with, uh, of uh, which these words or phrases are, um, are used. So werewolves and vampires, they're very closely linked. Um, in Europe, the wolf is the prevalent animal form for shapeshifters. Um, there's an extraordinary amount of um, antipathy towards wolves. Uh, there was a very odd uh, tale in Norway about a decade, maybe 15 years ago, when a wolf came down from um, northern, the, the, north, the northern Nordic countries from the Arctic Circle. It must have been a young male probably looking for a place to, to live and, uh, and survive. And he wandered down around the southern part of Norway, where most of the humans live, and created an enormous panic. Uh, parents didn't want to send their children to school for fear that the wolf would get them. Uh, there are very few legitimate or documented instances, by the way, of wolves actually killing people. Um, and so uh, Liam Neeson's latest movie notwithstanding, or pr latest but one movie, um, the, uh, uh, but the, there was a hunter in Norway who said that he would save the children and the elderly. The elderly were also very concerned about being taken by this wolf. And these, he went out and um, spent three or four months tracking the wolf, eventually shot it, brought it into town, took it, uh, had a, a press conference in his home, poured champagne over the wolf, gave champagne to everybody, took the wolf to the old age home, local old age home, showed them that they were now safe, and then took the wolf carcass to the uh, House of Parliament and had another sort of ritual there. This was all over one solitary wolf that uh, probably uh, was uh, had causing nobody any danger, but our archetypical um, uh, sort of image of wolves is more of the slide in the, uh, the photograph on the slide here of this extremely dangerous, extremely malevolent beast. Um, coincident with wolves and werewolves, we have the vampires, um, and vampires are very similar. Uh, werewolves and vampires sort of tend to sort of occupy the same space, shall we say. The vampires live on life forces and are capable of all sorts of dark magic, and the vampire myth and tradition is global. Every culture has something like a vampire in it. 
Um, uh, and vampires are once again closely aligned with werewolves or any other type of were animal. Um, the uh, recent survey by Fischoff et al. Um, at the turn of uh, the century um, asked people what, what monsters they preferred and the vampire came out to be the king of the monsters. The younger people, however, preferred the more violent slasher monsters like Freddy Krueger and they liked them for their killing prowess. The older people were more attracted to the non-slasher monsters like uh, Frankenstein and, and the vampires. Non-slashers were preferred for being objects of empathy, pity, and compassion. And overall, monsters were particularly liked for their intelligence, superhuman powers, and their ability to safely, safely show us the dark side of human nature. Once again, that's what we're dealing with with these monsters, is that we're looking at these sort of dark sides of human nature. I've also got a little photograph up here of the vampire bat. Uh, there are three species of vampire bats. Um, and um, if I may bore you for a moment with uh, some biochemistry, um, the vampire bat's a fascinating creature because it eats, it lives off blood. The problem with blood is that blood is, uh, is the vast majority of blood is a liquid that's of little or no help uh, in terms of nutrition. So when the vampire goes, uh, flies to its victim and then sort of at, at, attacks its victim and starts drinking the blood, um, it has to do something with all that liquid. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to fly back. Um, liquid, as we know, is heavy, and uh, it's not a very sort of good accompaniment to flight. And so the vampire bat has, the, has these amazing kidneys that allow it to almost immediately start excreting the liquid. And uh, so you'll see cows in, say, Central America will have this white um, streaks down their side. That means that there's a vampire bat that's been sitting on them taking blood and adding insults to injury has been peeing on them while it's been feeding. And the white is this sort of dried uric acid. So, I, so, but once again, the vampire bats share in our fear and sort of loathing of, um, of the monsters. But as I say, um, the fear and loathing of monsters is very, it's not absolute. Um, the vampire is currently our favorite, favorite monster. Some sort of interesting history and the biology of vampires. Um, during the 18th century, there was a major vampire scare in Eastern Europe, and you found even government officials who initially uh, were skeptical and poo-pooing the whole idea were dragged into the hunting and staking of, um, of bodies. Um, this outbreak occurred in 1721. A fellow by the name of Peter Plogo Jovitz died at the age of 62, but reportedly came back after his death asking his son for food. When the son refused, he was found dead the next day, and Plogo Jovitz returned and attacked some neighbors who died from loss of blood. Not uh, clear whether this is anything more than um, rumor and conjecture. But in the 1970s, 250 years later, um, there were rumors spread by the local press of a vampire in Highgate Cemetery. Uh, this is of interest to me because in the 1970s, I lived just down the road from the Highgate Cemetery. And we used to go up to Highgate Common um, uh, to the pub up there, the flask, and, uh, and we'll take guests up there because it was uh, one of these old sort of 12th century pubs in, in London and was a lovely spot. But um, it, this shows that the, the vampire myth is, is sort of, is only a myth uh, uh, sort of at a, at a very superficial level. Deeper down, there are lots of people who are more than willing to suspend uh, disbelief and believe in, in vampires. Um, in 1985, um, once again, uh, you've, you've got the misfortune of being um, talked, uh, talked at by, by a chemist. And so biochemistry is something of a passion of mine. And I became most intrigued uh, in this particular story. David Dolphin was a biochemist, and he suggested a biochemical basis for the vampire and also the werewolf leg legends. He suggested that a disease, a genetic disorder called congenital erythrocytic porphyria might explain the vampire phenomenon. Uh, this idea, I, I would hasten to add, has subsequently been debunked 
but it does make for an intriguing a anecdote, which I would also hasten to add is not really welcomed by the sufferers, people who suffer from congenital or erythrocytic porphyria, of whom there are not very many. At any rate, um, uh, Dolphin um, suggested that um, the vampire, the, the people who have this, this uh, defect in their enzyme behavior cannot make heme, which is the central um, chemical that um, carries oxygen through the blood. It's part of hemoglobin, the protein, but heme is the, is the uh, smaller molecule that actually carries the oxygen. So if you can't make heme, you're going to have a lack of, uh, of um, oxygen carrying capacity. And, but more importantly, in many respects, you also have a buildup of the precursors to heme, the porphyrins. There's a whole group of porphyrin molecules that will build up and lodge in the skin. And why this is important is that porphyrins are photoreactive. If the sun shines on a porphyrin, it causes a chemical reaction that produces nasty toxic substances in the body and it causes all sorts of skin lesions. So uh, the one way for somebody who's suffering from congenital erythropoietic porphyria to avoid these types of lesions is to stay out of the sun. And so um, the dolphin was speculated that uh, this particular genetic disorder may well have occurred somewhere in the mountain, in a village somewhere in the mountains of Transylvania and because these were isolated villages and if you got a gene that suddenly, with a mutation that suddenly appeared, it might well spread through the population. And in those villages, of course, this is back in sort of medieval, middle age times, uh, there were no street lights. And so if you weren't going to go out during the day, but only going to go out at night, the best time to, have gone, to go out would be when the moon is full. We could see where you're walking. Um, one of the other features of this particular uh, genetic disorder is that the sufferers um, experience hairiness, hirsutism, and excessive male growth. And so this is where some of the werewolf stuff comes from. Uh, in addition, um, these sufferers, uh, their lips uh, tend to pull back uh, on the face. The li lips crack. Uh, you'll get some bleeding, but also the porphyrin is a pigment and the, that pigment will deposit on the teeth and cause a reddish tint on the teeth. So uh, there you've got the lips pulling back, you've got the accentuation of the teeth and particularly the canines. And of course people who uh, couldn't make heme needed a source of heme and one excellent source of heme would be blood. And so um, that was, uh, Dolphin argued that uh, that's why they had this reputation for drinking blood. And finally, uh, one would need to avoid garlic uh, because garlic is a substance that has chemicals in it that promotes an enzyme that breaks down heme. So you don't want to, if, you, if, you, if it's difficult for you to get heme, you certainly don't want to increase its breakdown. So you avoid garlic so as not to um, increase the breakdown of heme. However, I would note um, that uh, the silver cross and the wooden stake uh, are most likely uh, simply figments of Bram Stoker's imagination. Unfortunately, as I said, um, people have discounted this idea. Um, unfortunately, from a biochemical perspective, people have discounted this idea because, in fact, sufferers of CEP um, uh, don't uh, get um, heme from blood. Um, if you do drink blood, uh, the uh, digestive juices will break down the chemicals, not just the protein, but also heme, and so you will still need to synthesize it, and so it's not possible to replace it with, uh, with a, uh, a, a diet of blood. Well, of course, uh, the most famous of the, va of the vampires is Bram Stoker's creation, Dracula, and there appears to be um, a real-life counterpart to Dracula, and uh, that is um, Vlad the um, Third, Vlad Dracul of Wallachia, Vlad Tepes. He was also uh, known as Vlad the Impaler. Uh, uh, existed in uh, the Transylvanian area around 1400. Uh, he resisted. He was a major figure in um, keeping the Turks from invading the rest of Europe. 
um, and um, he was a fairly unpleasant character, even by those standards. Uh, one of his favorite um, uh, tactics for dealing with people he didn't like, and it didn't take much for him not to like you, was to impale them, whereby you'd be impaled on a wooden stake and left there until you died. Um, so, um, so he's he's a perfectly acceptable character to uh, sort of invest with the sort of monstrous notions of Dracula. However, there's no actual indication that Vlad the Impaler drank blood. By contrast, um, one of his sort of contemporaries uh, was the Countess Bathory, uh, who was not clo fairly close by, and she apparently uh, wanted to maintain her youthful uh, looks and vigor and felt that by bathing and or drinking the blood of virgins, um, she would be able to do that. And so she had lots of young virgins killed and um, bathed in their blood and drank their blood. So uh, she's a, a, a reasonable um, uh, person to identify as a sort of composite, as part of the composite uh, person of Count Dracula. So the, the Count, of course, is our arch, archetypical uh, vampire. More recently, we've got many of our own monsters in our own society. And, um, and so there are lots and lots of fears that we deal with here. Um, uh, this was a drawing of a cat by a child um, that uh, would indicate uh, considerable disturbance. Jeffrey Dahmer, of course, um, is um, a monster uh, of our own making, um, of humankind, and um, uh, he uh, learned his trade, so to speak, um, uh, using animals. Um, there were bunches of animals that were sort of impaled on fences as he was growing up as a boy. Moving on to um, Hall <coughs> Halloween and um, the monsters of Halloween. One of the things I learned as preparing for this talk uh, that I found intriguing is that um, basically there's not a lot of research on either Halloween or frankly any of what they call the consumption holidays such as Christmas or Easter or whatever. Um, as we all know these holidays have become very um, commercialized and, and there are times for businesses to make money. But um, the, uh, one of these papers by Belk um, contrasted um, the Christmas and Halloween. And there's some fascinating contrasts here. In Christmas, adults wear costumes of good people, Santa Claus, uh, to extort good behavior from their children in exchange for durable goods. It takes place in the home, and it really is essentially a, a family uh, event. In Halloween, by contrast, children wear costumes of evil creatures. They extort non-durable goods, uh, candy, from adults with the threat of bad behavior. It takes place outside the home, and it's not really a family holiday. It's the time for, you, for the children to go out and meet strangers. And, and so you've got these two consumption holidays with these very contrasting themes. The actual history of Halloween goes back to Celtic uh, times. Samhain was the Lord of the Dead. Uh, the term also means summer's end in, in Celtic language, in Erse. And on the Samhain night, the ghosts of the dead emerged and visited their old homes. Witches and hobgoblins with more orgiastic, mischievous, or malevolent intent also roamed the earth at this time. Uh, people lit the fires in part to scare away these ghosts and uh, also to purify um, the, the environment. Um, the association with spirits, the dead, and with evil remain attached to contemporary Halloween celebrations. So it's, uh, it's, it's part of the, the background. Um, Pope Gregory IV in sort of 80, 835 um, was concerned, in fact, the, the, as I say, the early Christian church was concerned about lots of these pagan rituals. And of course, what Christianity tended to do was just um, uh, adopt and um, sort of take in um, of these, these rituals and events and make them their own. And so uh, Pope Gregory designated November 1st, or Samhain, as All Hallows, All Saints Day. And that's where we get the name Halloween, 
It was known by American colonists, but apparently wasn't celebrated in this country until after 1840, uh, when the paper famine, potato famine resulted in a large number of Irish immigrants who had been celebrating these things. Remember, uh, I Ireland was part of the Celtic community. And so uh, these sorts of uh, traditions would have had stronger roots in those places. So what is Halloween and, and what's happening? It's, it's estimated that 93% of U.S. households with children under age 12 participate in trick-or-treating. However, in the past decade or, so, or more, Halloween celebrations have been seeing a shift to more adult activities. Um, so um, while children continue to do this, and as we know, our teenagers um, also do it, but it's becoming my assessment is it's becoming decidedly uncool to be for a teenager to go out and, and do trick-or-treating, uh, but many still do. The lure of candy is still too strong. But it's the, the Halloween is the antithesis of other holidays, other U.S. holidays. As um, mentioned in the previous slide, the witch, uh, there are these sort of contrasts. And in Halloween, the witch is the inversion of the American mother figure. Her sex, her ugliness, her age, her nocturnal preference and malevolence stand in opposition to Santa Claus, Cupid, and the Easter Bunny, the other, the other um, creatures or uh, individuals or uh, 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 sort of figures of uh, other major consumption holidays. For the young child, Halloween's implicit function is served by the child's going out into the night uh, and the mastery of fear. And it might seem strange that children would dress up as scary monsters and visit spook houses in order to master their fears, but this, in fact, is the way these fears are met. And, you know, uh, I, I mean, we, I, my children loved Roald Dahl, but one has to admit that as an adult, uh, as a father or as a, a, a mother, reading Roald Dahl to your children, it is a little uncomfortable with the way adults are, are portrayed and the sort of um, undermining and revolutionary elements in those stories. But the kids love them. Uh, for adults, um, why would adults start to sort of become more engaged in Halloween? One of the arguments that's been suggested is that it's a response to economic and other uncertainties and, and um, that during the Depression, for example, was another upsurge of interest in Halloween. So, you know, these are, these are the sorts of things. And, and I, I can't finish without sort of discussing one final monster, and that's uh, Dr. Frankenstein's creation. Uh, many people mistake the monster as being called Frankenstein. The monster, in fact, has no name. Uh, Frankenstein was the man who created it, and uh, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's classic novel, Frankenstein, was published in 1818. It started a phenomenon that has survived the years and permeates many aspects of our culture. It spawned numerous films, television book programs, books, comics, etc. And the Frankenstein catalog that was compiled aptly by a man by the name of Donald Glutt uh, in 1984 consisted of 525 pages documenting over 5,000 instances in which uh, the Frankenstein monster has appeared in movies, films, uh, uh, comic books, television shows, and so on. Um, so it's, it's certainly uh, a creature that inspires a lot of attention and concern. And as, as uh, mentioned from the survey back in 2000, um, uh, Frankenstein is a favorite of adults as opposed to um, the, uh, uh, as opposed to the younger monster-loving community. I have no idea why we get so much pleasure out of these monsters and, frankly, horrific creatures and activities. Um, but um, they, uh, I always remember um, uh, being told by uh, somebody when I was growing up that um, they, they, they couldn't wait for the next monster movie to come out. Uh, I've always avoided monster movies myself. Um, I, I don't find the notion of being terrified by a, a particularly egregious and um, virulent and violent monster uh, particularly entertaining. But there are people for whom this is entertainment du jour and the 
ultimate in entertainment. And so, um, but I think what we need to recognize is that in many cases these monsters uh, represent uh, a human-animal bond that is different from the one that we have typically been talking about, which is the positive side of the bond. But uh, nonetheless, many of these monsters and these monstrous animals are, in the words of the famous anthropologist Levi Strauss, very good to think. So I'm wishing you all a monstrous Halloween, and thank you very much for your attention to this afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowan. This is amazing. We do have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, if you'd like to pose a question, please put it in the chat box. Um, I, I did note one chat uh, feature as we were talking. Uh, Dr. Rowan, as you were talking about Etienne de Bourbon and the uh, St. Guinefort and dogs, one of the participants pointed out an analogy and a similarity with the Disney movie Lady and the Tramp, where Lady saves uh, a baby by going after the rat. So there are yes. some similarities even in Walt Disney. Well, Walt Disney, uh, when you say even in Walt Disney, in fact, Walt Disney is a sort of um, uh, the epitome, epitome of using some of these really pretty graphic and horrible tales um, to um, and sort of making them safer and softer um, and uh, bringing them into our children's entertainment. Um, I always remember that we used to play a, a game of Ring a Ring of Roses uh, as, as, as young children. And Ring a Ring of Roses was all about the Black Death and the plague, but it came down. By the time it reached us, we uh, I had to become an adult to discover what it was. The other sort of nursery game that we played was uh, the Bells of St. Clements. You know, here comes an axe to chop off your head, and the kids would sort of you'd go between uh, two people with their arms raised, and suddenly you'd bring your arms down on the head of somebody and chop off their head. Well, the, the St. Clemens was the church that was right next to the gallows um, uh, or the executioner's block in London. And it, the last thing that the executed people would hear would be the bells of St. Clemens tolling for them. And so there are all of these things that are, um, uh, you, you know, we see them as somehow or other sort of nice or gentle or whatever, but they, they have pretty grotesque and gruesome uh, antecedents. Thank you. Uh, another participant mentioned that, uh, and I didn't notice if it was a he or a she, sorry, they have used Harry Potter and some of the um, critters in that to help teach humane education. Uh, you spoke of Harry Potter and the prevalence of wizardry and uh, how that really has taken off in the last decade or so. Right. Yes, well, Harry Potter uh, came across uh, many of these monsters. Uh, these animals are, that are, are archetypes of our um, under uh, un the undercurrents of our beings and our sort of spiritual uh, fears. Um, so uh, I mean, it, yes, I, I mean Harry Potter. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think why the tales are so uh, um, compelling to to not just children but also to adults is because they they have these sorts of long running. Um, essential core themes that uh, fill uh, nursery tales, fill stories, and part of Harry Potter. But it's a wonderful idea to use the hippogriff as a way to teach humane education. I wonder if they use the dragons. The dragons are a little less uh, likable in Harry Potter. <laughs> Um, I have another question from a participant about whether we can share some of the source materials you've used. And if it's OK with Dr. Rowan, we can certainly send those out to anyone who is interested. We will probably include a link with the uh, information we send out uh, post-webinar. Yes, I, I would mention that I, I, a lot of the image I used, uh, I just took um, as a sort of common usage. It's OK for one to use them. Um, as um, in, in giving a talk of this nature, it's not okay uh, to sort of reprint or republish them or, or, or do any of that sort of nature with them because I don't have permission to do that. Okay, thank you. The things that we can share, we will share. Yeah. Uh, one last question on the chat box it has to do with whether our infatuation with these animals and the, the um, 
crossover may have something to do with um, hy hybridity and our likeness to that which we do not fully understand. It is. It's it's the otherness issue that's important here. But um, you know, there 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 are all of these stories about um, gods and animals um, having offspring that are sort of mixed elements of both human and animal, like the Minotaur, for example. Um, and um, the there are uh, there's great um, uh, fear about this sort of hybridization. That is part of the reason, I think, today why um, genetic engineer, genetically engineered animals uh, create so much concern is because they're not quote-unquote natural. They're not produced in natural ways. And there's nothing less natural in human society than the product of a human and animal uh, inter sexual interaction. And so yeah. these are sort of, total, from, a, from a sort of cultural taboo perspective, there is nothing that is more taboo than these types of ideas, these types of animals and these types of themes. So it's a very big deal um, uh, for, for this, but, it's, but it does represent, as I say, that, that otherness, that alterity that um, uh, we sort of worry about. And that, as, you, as you said at the beginning, Joan, uh, in, informs our nightmares. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Rowan, and thank you to everyone who has joined us for this fun and informative webinar. Uh, we will be posting the webinar, as you can see in the chat room. Uh, you can revisit it or invite others to experience it. Um, we will have two new webinars in November and one in December. We'll send you that information as well. We appreciate your joining us today. Hope to see you again very soon, and have a safe, safe and happy Halloween. Thank you, everyone.